Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Michel Kazachkin. I am the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy on HIV AIDS in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, a former Executive Director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria. But I'm speaking today as a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy uh, as this press conference is to introduce a session that will take place at 1 p.m. that is co-hosted by the International AIDS Society and the Global Commission on Drug Policy. The, Glo the Global Commission um, has 20 members, uh, of which the names are shown on the screen. It is chaired by the former president of Brazil, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, and it is a commission, what we do is advocacy at the global and the political level for drug policy reform. We advocate for evidence-based, human rights-based, public health-based approaches to, to drug policy. Joining me for this press conference uh, is a remarkable panel, Justice Michael Kirby, who needs no introduction here in, in Australia, but I'd like to um, mention that uh, Justice Kirby has been a member of the commission, the UNAIDS Commission on uh, HIV and the law, because I, I find it remarkable how much overlap there is between the conclusions of that commission and those of, of the Commission on Drug Policy. Also joining us, the Honorable Peter Dunn, MP from New Zealand, Minister of Internal Affairs and Associated, Associate Minister of Health, uh, who will talk about some of the uh, extremely innovative approaches that New Zealand is taking to new psychoactive substances. Alex Vodak, um, a physician, I guess well known also here in Australia, a pioneer in harm reduction. Uh, Judy Byrne, who will be the voice of the people using drugs, and in about 20 minutes or so, we will be joined by Svetlana Moroz, who is uh, from the network of women living with HIV in Donetsk, in Ukraine, uh, and we will have part of this press conference also devoted to the uh, disastrous consequences of the discontinu discontinuation of harm reduction and opioid substitute therapy in Crimea following the annexation of Crimea and, and the new authorities. The session um, on drug policy will take place at 1 p.m. For that session, we will be joined by video by another uh, of the global commissioners, and that will be Sir Richard Branson, who will talk to us on, I mean, he'll be by Skype or whatever new technology uh, um, intervening and, 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 and talking to us and, and responding, answering questions. Let me just frame the issue by saying that um, the international drug regime is a prohibitionist regime um, that so that um, in most countries in the world, um, the use or possession uh, of drugs is a criminal offense. Um, the way the regime functions is that it has generated aggressive law enforcement across the world, uh, a war on drugs, and often a war on users that has had disastrous consequences. Uh, first, it has failed its own objective of decreasing uh, drug use and drug availability, as drugs are more easily available now, be them the conventional drugs, heroin, or the new psychoactive substances and synthetic drugs. Um, prohibition and law enforcement have resulted in a major health crisis. At least one in five people injecting drugs across the world is infected with HIV, two out of three infected with hepatitis C, co-infections rates are somewhere around 70 to 90 percent. Um, it has generated huge social violence. Think of the 50,000 deaths 
in, in Mexico alone since the war on drugs has started. It is undermining human rights. It is spurring crime. And of course, it is um, generating a huge, um, over $300 billion black um, criminal market, parallel market. It is undermining development and security. It is wasting billions of precious resources on ineffective uh, prohibition law enforcement. In short, it is time to reform. And, and that is what we will be talking about. Of course, because this is an AIDS conference, the focus will largely be on health, drugs, health, and, and HIV, a large focus on harm reduction, uh, and um, um, how countries that have early implemented harm reduction see basically no more infections with HIV among people who use drugs, whereas countries that have resisted implementing at large scale health-based interventions and harm reduction see uh, still expanding epidemics, as it is the case in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, we will hear, as I said before, from Minister Dunn on the courageous, I would say, and certainly very innovative approaches that New Zealand is taking to in regulating psychoactive substances. And then we'll come back to the issue of opioid substitute therapy and harm reduction by focusing on this scientifically and uh, from a human perspective, unjustifiable uh, discontinuation of opioid substitute therapy in, uh, that happened in Crimea after um, the new authorities uh, took over. We have a few people also in the audience, including Andrei Klepikov, who is the head of the HIV AIDS Alliance in Ukraine. So we can have more of that debate. We have also in the audience a few people that are very knowledgeable on harm reduction um, that can intervene. Let me just also draw your attention uh, to the fact that you will find, leaving this room, uh, copies of um, three reports that the Global Commission has already published. The first one was called War on Drugs, and war is erased here. Uh, basically, it's the War on Drug Has Failed, 2011. Then, how the War on Drugs is fueling the global HIV pandemic, 2012, a report on hepatitis C, 2013. The next and uh, report of the Global Commission will be launched in New York on September 9 uh, this year. So without further ado, uh, let me now ask um, the panel to come with their comments. Um, and maybe we'll start with you, uh, Michael. Thank you very much, uh, Michel, uh, and good morning, everybody. I am here because I was a member of the other Global Commission, that is the Global Commission on HIV and the Law. And uh, common membership between the two commissions was established by uh, former President Cardozo of Brazil, who was the uh, chair of the Global Commission on HIV and the Law. Here is a report of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, which is outside on the table and available to you. Here is the report on, uh, of the Global Commission on HIV and the Law on Risks, Rights and Health. Uh, and uh, as uh, our chair has said, this report uh, and this report are both written in the context of the epidemic of HIV and AIDS. And what is said by me today is, re is restricted to that area. This is the legitimacy of the report of the Global Commission on HIV and the Law addressing the HIV AIDS epidemic. Uh, there were basically two big common themes of this report. The first was that the law, as it affects certain vulnerable populations, is playing a very adverse effect, having a very adverse effect and playing a uh, counterproductive role 
in respect of the uh, epidemic and in respect of the rollout of the antiretroviral drugs. The essential common theme of these marginalised groups uh, is this, that if you criminalise and penalise people uh, in the marginal groups, MSM, men who have sex with men, mostly gay men, uh, sex workers, people who use drugs, prisoners, refugees, uh, and other vulnerable groups, if you stigmatise and criminalise them, then first you don't get into their minds so that they know about an epidemic that might affect them, they know about what they should do to protect themselves, they know about how important it is to take the test, they know about the uh, care and treatment, including antiretrovirals, that will be available if they take the test. And they know about the fact that if they take the test and get onto the ARVs, this will not only be very good for them, but good for society by acting as a prevention of other people getting the virus and reducing their viral load so that they are not a risk to others, particularly in sexual or uh, drug-related activities. Um, so that's the first common theme. The second uh, theme of this report, the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, is on another area where the law uh, intrudes in a hostile way to the AIDS epidemic, and that relates to global intellectual property law, patent law. Eyes tend to glaze over when you talk about that because people think it's boring and it's uh, hard to understand, and to some extent that's right. But it's tremendously important in the field of HIV and AIDS because of the huge costs of antiretroviral and other drugs and the way in which the law protecting patent rights uh, protects disproportionate profits that can be made in that area. But that's not an area that is of immediate concern to this press conference or the issue of uh, drugs. It's a very important theme of this report, but the aspect of the report of the Glo Global Commission on HIV and the Law that is critical to the press conference and to the session at one o'clock today is people who use drugs as a minority uh, vulnerable group uh, and helping them to protect themselves and thereby to protect society. Now, the recommendations of the Global Commission on HIV and the law in this area were basically very simple and they were basically only five. First of all, that uh, all systems of compulsory detention of people who use drugs should be abolished. Uh, because having that system makes people um, alienated from their society and outside the messages that are essential to protect them and thereby to protect society. Second, the systems of national registration of drug users should be abolished, again, because that's a hostile, discriminatory way of acting. It's not a harm reduction way of acting. It's a hostile way that alienates people from the messages central to their own protection and thereby the protection of society. Uh, thirdly, that there should be a ban on all laws and policies that restrict uh, needle exchange. That is to say, the capacity of people uh, who use dr drugs by needle injection to uh, secure sterile needles in exchange for any used needles and thereby to take out of the market needles that might uh, be a way of uh, extending the HIV virus, the human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, the fourth is the enactment uh, of laws uh, that uh, decriminalise uh, the possession of drugs for personal use. 
uh, and the removal of the heavy hand of the law in that area in the so-called war on drugs. Prime Minister Tony Abbott of Australia recently made a, a statement in which he said that in Australia the war on drugs uh, has failed. Um, he didn't draw an inference from that that uh, the war should be stopped. Uh, the inference he drew is that we still have to keep on with this war because it's a, it's a war that has to be fought, even if it can't be won. Uh, however, many people uh, will draw the inference that something better than a war has to be adopted, uh, and uh, that uh, is the inference from the Prime Minister's statement. But Mr Abbott is the first Prime Minister of Australia ever to acknowledge that the war on drugs uh, is being lost uh, and the inference that many draw from that conclusion is that some new and different policy should be adopted. The fifth uh, recommendation was that international law should be reformed. There are basically three great international treaties, well there are three big international treaties, great in the sense of big, that uh, bind uh, member countries to adopt the prohibitionist model. It's actually quite interesting to study the history of the prohibitionist model. It emerged in the state of Maine in the United States of America in the 1830s. Uh, the good citizens of Maine thought it would be a good thing to prohibit uh, the use of alcohol. And they, uh, they enacted laws and they began promoting the copying of those laws throughout the United States of America. And that led on to the amendment of the Constitution of the United States to ban uh, the uh, alcohol. That led to the, um, the debates during the 1920s and 30s uh, that led ultimately to the repeal of that provision of the United States Constitution. But the legacy of it is we're still stuck with the prohibitionist model in the international field. And the question is whether we don't need the same sort of repeal as the United States uh, adopted uh, in early 1931, I think it was, to get rid of the prohibitionist main uh, provision in the United States laws. So these are what the Global Commission on HIV and the law has proposed. It's actually quite interesting if you follow international media the Economist in recent weeks has been analysing, first of all, uh, the repeal of, in many states of the United States of the ban on marijuana. Uh, in some states, a complete removal of the criminalisation of marijuana. In some states, a removal of the criminalisation where marijuana will be used for uh, medicinal purposes, uh, medical purposes. So, and the Economist editorial line is supporting the type of recommendations that have been proposed by the, uh, the Global Commission. So what appeared to be a minority view is increasingly becoming a view that is uh, accepted. And in particular, in the context of AIDS, uh, the injection of drugs is an extremely serious way of presenting the uh, the uh, virus to many people. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. The, um, I will now give the floor to Judy Byrne, uh, a long time activist fighting for the rights and the health of people using drugs. Um, we're joined by Svetlana Moroz from the Network of Women Living with HIV uh, in Ukraine, um, and uh, I'd like to ask the members of the panel to, pr to please stick to three minutes or so, so that we make sure we have enough time for discussion with the, with the audience and with the press. Uh, Judy. Good morning. Um, I'm chair of the International Network of People Who Use Drugs. I've been an injecting drug user for the last 40 years. And, you know, I, I don't think it's unfair to say sometimes in countries like Australia that HIV saved my life. 
because without HIV there would have been no methadone program that I could have accessed and that's kept me free of overdose. I mean, most of us have hepatitis C. That was inevitable because hepatitis C was around long before HIV and drug users weren't in contact with many services before HIV came around. So although, you know, it's killed many of my community, it's been a means by which we've been able to get harm reduction happening, needle exchange, OST in many countries. There's a lot of work still to be done. Um, I, I don't think we're anywhere near where we need to be. I mean, as chair of this network, my day is often punctuated with litanies of abuses from people around the world who are members of my community who were beaten up by police, locked in detention centres, had their children taken away from them, lost their jobs, lost their houses, lost their only means of living because what they do is take a different drug or take a drug by a different means. Drug use is, is part of the human condition. Most people use drugs in one way, shape or form. We have to stop pretending that we can make a war on something that people want to do and sometimes need to do. The structural issues around people who use drugs trying to access services, trying to make their lives even vaguely livable are just so profoundly um, negative that we even struggle in countries like Australia and in England to make reasonable and successful lives for ourselves because the stigma people feel against us and the fear. People are really afraid of us. You know, I wonder what it is about us. It is so frightening. Um, different people, people are different. None of us have to be the same or act the same or live the same way. And if people have access to the things they need, the drugs they need in a timely, reasonable, humane fashion, everybody can just get along in a much more civilised way. A war on drugs is a war on us and we're really tired of it. We've lost too many millions of people. People know what to do. The Global Commission on the Law, the Global Commission on Drug Policy, it's laid out. Words, words, words. We need some action to go behind the words. We've had enough death. It's time for it to finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, Alex. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. Uh, there are many connections between HIV infection and preventing that spreading among and from people who inject drugs and the global policy of drug prohibition. Uh, one of the connections is that, the, uh, that we learned very quickly how to respond effectively to control HIV spreading among people who inject drugs uh, soon after the epidemic was first recognised in the 1980s. And those measures are, by and large, uh, pretty effective. Uh, they have very few uh, important negative adverse consequences. Um, they have a lot of other secondary benefits and they're pretty inexpensive. And this is in sharp contrast to the efforts to try and control the supply of drugs. And the world during the 20th century set its mind to trying to control drug use, trying to prevent the supplies of drug use getting to people who wanted to use drugs. And that has, as uh, Professor Kazakhstein has already mentioned, has been an abject failure. It's been an abject failure in the sense that the drug market has steadily expanded that high, higher, more dangerous drugs and more risky practices have replaced less dangerous drugs and less risky practices. And the outcomes have been truly shocking in terms of increasing numbers, and we've heard some of this already, increasing numbers of deaths, disease, crime, corruption, violence, uh, threats to national security, and undermining important civic institutions, Supreme Courts, the judicial system. Uh, and not only has the war on drugs been a, a comprehensive failure, but it's also been extraordinarily expensive. So the contrast couldn't be more stark between the inexpensive, effective and safe harm reduction approach to drug use that has helped control the spread of HIV and the war on drugs approach. And for this reason, we are seeing the slow collapse now of the global drug prohibition system. Uh, Minister Dunn on my left from New Zealand was uh, instrumental in bringing a policy of regulation of new psychoactive substances into his country in New Zealand um, in July last year. And in the, and I recommend you read the wonderful speech that was made in the New Zealand Parliament on July the 11th by the minister introducing that bill. And he talked about the, the 
the, the bill was being introduced to protect New Zealanders, particularly young New Zealanders, I'm quoting him almost word for word, and he said the central problem is untested drugs in an unregulated marketplace. And that indeed is the central problem, untested drugs, unregulated marketplace. And what we have to do now, and it's starting to happen, is move from a law enforcement defined problem to a problem that is defined as primarily a health and social problem. Because the health and social interventions work, they're much cheaper, they don't have the nasty consequences, whereas the criminal justice approach, customs, police, courts and prisons, crop eradication, these things don't really work in the way that harm reduction works, and they're very expensive. So we're starting to see, as um, Michael Kirby has, say, has been saying, we're starting to see this system slowly collapsing with Colorado and Washington states and the United States uh, starting to regulate cannabis January the 1st and then earlier this month in Washington state, in Uruguay, and we're also seeing what's happened in Jamaica this year and in New Zealand last year with the newly, uh, with the new psychoactive substances being regulated, a world first. So it's a, it's a very important time and we can't move fast enough to get rid of the global system of drug prohibition, uh, prohibition and replace it with a system which is more effective, less expensive, more humane and more respectful of human rights. And in that way we'll find that people like Jude who uh, have really struggled in the prohibition environment, more, many more of them will lead normal and useful lives as full members of the community, something that's not possible to achieve at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, may I just add that the debate um, um, is, is even more, will become even more in intense in the next months as the General Assembly of the United Nations and the Secretary General have called on a special session of the United Nations General Assembly on drugs that will take place in March 2016. And that will be the first time for 18 years uh, that uh, the United Nations at the level of heads of states and governments will meet uh, on the world drug problem. So we have one and a half years you know, of intense debate hopefully to move the, the issue. Minister Dunn, thank you for joining us. Well, th thank you and good morning. Uh, I, I simply want to give you a very quick outline of the path that New Zealand has been down and some of the issues that we face uh, in doing so. When the flood of new psychoactive substances that's going worldwide became obvious in New Zealand about three years ago, our initial reaction was to seek to do what everyone was trying to do and that was ban them. And we introduced legislation at that time that allowed me as the minister to issue a 12-month ban that could be rolled over for another 12 months for identified products. And our products were coming in and being tested to show that they contained new combinations of substances and the ban was being applied. And I kept thinking of the image when you're standing at an airport at dusk and you're watching the aircraft land and you see the lights of the one coming in to land, you see the lights of the one behind it and behind it and behind that. I knew that every time we banned something, within days, a variant appeared on the market. We were quite happy in one sense to carry on playing that game of Skittles. You put them up, we'll knock them down. But it was essentially pointless. And so we decided fairly early on that we had to change the game. Given that the volume of these substances was not going to diminish, given that the public appeal, if you like, of them uh, for certain groups of the population was probably not, not going to diminish. What was a better way of dealing with it? So we decided to take an approach which, is, which was essentially to say that if you, a manufacturer or supplier, can prove that your products are of low risk, yet to be defined, but of low risk, we will allow them on the market. So in other words, we shifted the onus of proof to the manufacturer and the supplier rather than making a decision ourselves. Uh, that's the theory. The Psychoactive Substances Act, uh, which has already been referred to, which was passed last July, essentially did a couple of things. Firstly, it provided for the establishment of this new regime. Second, it said that all uh, products that were on the market at that point uh, would effectively come off until such time as they could be tested. Therein lies what has been the controversy we've had in the last 12 months, because pragmatically, 
we decided actually there were about 40 apparently low-risk products on the market that we could allow to remain on the market while the new regime, the regulatory regime, was developed, which we expected would take weeks to months at most. Sadly, by early this year, that process had not been completed. A public um, attention was mounting and being stirred up by various groups in the community about how, in fact, the Psychoactive Substances Act wasn't working because we still had all these substances on the market. Why didn't we just move and ban them all? Ironically, two years earlier when we said we were going to move away from bans, people said, no, that's right, that's a sensible approach. So we got caught in a bit of moral panic. And I had to introduce, I was faced at that point with a potential political crisis in that the pressure was coming from all quarters, even though Parliament, with the exception of one vote, had voted for the original legislation. We're having an election campaign in New Zealand at the moment, so everyone got cold feet and suddenly decided they had to get on the side of communities, and therefore, why didn't we just ban the stuff outright? And I thought, to preserve the Psychoactive Substances Act, we, we, we made amendments in May which essentially were very minor but significant. We simply removed the interim approvals for the existing products and said that they would have to be withdrawn pending their submission to the testing regime. And because of a mounting but separate issue relating to animal testing, we said that animal testing would not, prove, would not be part of that regime. So the Psychoactive Substances Act is still in place. The regime that it establishes is still the law. The government will shortly pass regulations to give effect to a whole lot of its technical provisions and a further set of regulations uh, early next year to set in place the, the retail market. But it, I just would make the observation that we made the choice originally because we knew what we had in place previously wasn't going to work long term. We've embarked upon a new path that has not been out without difficulty, but we are determined to stay the course because we know realistically there is no other way of dealing with this issue. And if it means that uh, we have a situation where some of these products become available and are of low risk to end users, so be it. That's not a choice that we actually wish to make. That's for manufacturers, suppliers and consumers to make. Uh, whether that has wider implications is another story for another time. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Peter. As I said earlier, within days uh, after the new authorities took over in Crimea, the decision was taken to discontinue methadone programs, opioid substitute therapy in Crimea, uh, since, as you may know, methadone and opioid substitute therapy are illegal in the Russian Federation. Uh, that has, is having disastrous consequences uh, on the cohort of people uh, who were on OST in Crimea, 800 people in that cohort, um, at the same time as there are around 15,000 people uh, in needle exchange programs in Crimea. And we will now see a short video that we just received from Crimea. It's about four minutes. Uh, and then we'll have a few comments from you, uh, Svetlana, uh, which I introduced you prior to you coming in the room. Um, a few comments from you, and then we'll open it for, for questions and comments. то, что я пять лет восстанавливала, собирала по крупицам и следила за здоровьем, все остановилось, и жить не хочется. Это помимо того, что я понимала заместительную терапию, я стояла на учете в спеццентре, получала ретровирусную терапию, противотуберкулезную, цирроз печени, переболела гепатитом А, Б и С. Обострились хронические болезни. Все, что раньше вроде как-то стабилизировалось, более-менее чувствовала себя нормально, сейчас невыносимо болит все. 
не приравниваю нас к онкологически больным, но, мне кажется, им даже в какой-то степени немножко легче. У нас куча заболеваний, таких, я говорю, у которых третья, четвертая стадия, уже последние стадии. Вынужде находить на работу, это я хожу через такие усилия, через такие боли, потому что надо как-то содержать семью, трое детей надо кормить. После того, как закрылась заместительная терапия, два раза нам выписали рецепты на травмодол по 20 капсул. Получили. И после этого ну, не стали выписывать, сказали, что препарата нет, что его забрали в стационар, как бы для других больных. Приезжали, приезжал какой-то министр здравоохранения с России и обещал, что нас не оставят в беде, что нас не бросят, ну, считай, умирать, а помогут с препаратами, что это все будет безболезненно, что нас поддержат не только в лечении, но и в реабилитации, и помогут дальше как-то свою жизнь наладить. Но ничего мы этого не получили. Приезжали из Ленинграда, из Москвы, приезжали два психолога, как они там нас уговаривали, что надо отсюда бежать, а куда бежать? Ну, обещали, что будут давать препараты и детокс. Но ну, на себе я этого не получила, и ни один мой знакомый, все вот научиваются, все, все погибают, все вернулись тоже в болото. сопутствующий болячек, половина, мне кажется, умрет, потому что не выдержит очень тяжело эту кумару переносить. Может, кто-то просто будет дальше продолжать колоться, если есть возможность финансы, потому что сейчас с этим очень тяжело. Я лично за себя я точно знаю, что без, без заместительной терапии это все это крест. Потому что я говорю, то, что с таким трудом я восстанавливала, возвращала, хранила, сейчас все идет на смарку. Нет, я не думала, что так вот жестоко вот это все будет, что без... Ведь это такие, такие боли. Ну, сейчас вот весна, все такое цветет, а ты не рад, даже сам себе не рад. Дышать не хочется, на то, что что-то делать. Я считаю, что, например, люди, которые были на программе, которые имели кучу дианозов, смертельных дианозов, по сути, и гепатиты, и цирроз, и ВИЧ-инфекции в четвертой стадии, я думаю, что таких людей не должны бросать. Или бы уже нас собрали все в кучу, где-то подожгли, или вывезли, утопили, чтобы мы не мучились, не мучили окружающих. Ведь страдали не только, но и те, кто рядом с нас. И родители, и дети страдают. And uh, I would also like to say that at the, um, in addition to the reports from the Global Commission, which I mentioned earlier, you will find as you go out a paper that was published in the BMJ uh, a few, two months ago uh, on this Crimean uh, crisis. But let's have Svetlana add a few comments and then open all of this for discussion. Sveta. Uh, it's really difficult to comment this uh, because I have only one question, who is responsible on this. A uh, couple uh, days ago I met here my colleagues from St. Petersburg, from NGO EVA, it's a women NGO. They received a, a hotline call from pregnant women from Crimea. Uh, she said, what I have to do, 
I have no money, I have no support, I have no place to live. I am former substitution program client. What I have to do, please help me. At the same time, for the next day, EVA organization received the call from drug control <laughs> entity because they collect information about all former patients of OST programs without advising any support for them. Currently, we have a good programs, and thank you for that for International AIDS Alliance. You can ask more comments about this. Uh, these programs aim to support the, and uh, continue uh, uh, substitution opioid treatment for former patients from Crimea. Uh, I think Andrei Klepikov can give you more information on this. Uh, and of course, it's a big tragedy for these people, and uh, it's illustrate how uh, drug policy, punitive drug policy, uh, influence on uh, real people's lives, and also how it's contribute into AIDS epidemic in our countries. Uh, um, you know, I'm from Donetsk province. Uh, where now um, military conflict and uh, some of my colleagues uh, was forced to move to Kyiv to continue OST treatment because we are in the threat of treatment interruption and many Slovyansk patients now in different cities of Ukraine uh, also to prevent treatment interruption. So it's really important to pay attention on this issue because it's directly, very directly related to drug policy, to criminalization, and also political will in our region. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sveta. Um, I will now open it for discussion and questions. I'm sorry we, we spoke a little longer than we thought, but um, these were so, all, we, we had so powerful messages from all speakers that uh, I guess everyone will agree it was worth listening to. So please, uh, questions. And, and do please come to the microphone. Yes, please. Thank you. Could you be kind identifying yourself? Sure. I'm uh, Tim from Vice Magazine. Uh, my question's for Peter Dunn. Uh, just wondering how you're planning on changing the public perception on the legality of drugs. That it seems to still be a very conservative culture and not want it, even drug takers themselves often. I think um, time will be the healer there. Um, the public mood earlier this year was just get the stuff out of sight, out of mind. Because of the way that we made the law change and the, the introduction of the new testing regime, uh, to some extent that's dealt to that concern. Another important element of what we've done is we've required our local authorities, our local councils, to develop plans within their areas for where um, these products might be able to be sold. One of the little ironies of the whole thing was that that's what the councils asked for, was the power to regulate things locally. When we gave them that power, they said this was central government dumping its responsibilities on local government. In other words, it was all too hard for them. But I think once they work out their own plans and what suits their own situations, uh, and products start to re-emerge over the next uh, couple of years or so, I suspect we'll find that there's a much calmer environment than the hysteria that we dealt with um, uh, earlier this year. And at that point, I think that people will begin to wonder what all the fuss was about, frankly. Thank you. Other, yes, please. Hi, my name is Peter Schmidt from the uh, German newspaper Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. I was wondering, what are the people doing when they are not on OST anymore? Are they going back to the drugs? 
And my second question is, uh, what is on the CRIM with ARTs? Uh, are they still getting ARTs, the people who are HIV infected? Sveta, I guess you can answer those questions, and then, Andre, if you wish to add a comment after Sveta's. Yeah, like it was said in the video, uh, many of them uh, come back to the illicit drugs, street drugs, and uh, uh, some of them now move to uh, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian Materikova chest Ukraine. Continental part of Ukraine, uh, for instance, in Kiev, Sumy, uh, Poltava cities, where they co uh, can continue uh, OST. And uh, about our retreatment, uh, uh, I know it's still available in Crimea. And also it's uh, available in continental part of Ukraine, so people can continue. Since God, they can continue. And also TB treatment, uh, hep C treatment. Andre? Yeah, I would like to add if I uh, can. So situation is very fragile because actually out of 800 patients in Crimea, only 57 moved to continental part of Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, only also uh, uh, patients from other regions, from Donetsk and Lugansk, where Svetlana is from. So totally, uh, we have uh, 120 patients from all regions under conflict or annexation. Uh, but the patients facing huge pressure from Russian authorities not to move, even from their families. So several of them committed suicide, basically, because psychologically, they faced huge pressure uh, because from one side they were forced to stop the treatment, which can be considered as a torture, torturing. Uh, from another side, they had huge pressure from the environment to stay in the country, or in, in Crimea, in their homes. Uh, I have the list of people, but not willing to share it uh, for confidential reason, uh, but truly, uh, uh, this uh, uh, committee, uh, uh, drug policy committee, is quite important because uh, it's not only about big politics, it's not only about papers, it's about uh, saving uh, uh, human lives. And in Crimea we saw how policies can be changed literally overnight, uh, unexpectedly, and how it affected human lives, including a number of deaths. Thank you, uh, Andre. Any other comment or question? Of course, uh, if, if this is agreeable to the panelists, anyone uh, on the panel in the, in the next few minutes before the session will be available for questions or individual interviews. Uh, any other comment at this time? If not, I'd like to... Uh, Thank all the panelists, particularly uh, Svetlana, for joining us um, as she ran out of, of another session. Um, but your testimony was um, extremely powerful, and I think many of us are still under shock after watching that um, video. Thank you all for coming, and please disseminate the message, it is time to reform drug policies. Thank you.